Welcome everyone to another video. From the scheme of the last weeks, you probably guessed it's time for another vintage computing video. Today I have here Sun Spark Station 2 that was announced in 1990 and apparently supported until about 2000. The initial Spark Station was the first machine using Sun's own Spark microprocessor, Spark standing for Scalable Processor Architecture, one of those RISC architectures that were created from various university research. Also a pizza box style case, although slightly smaller than the Ultra 5 that you have seen in the previous video. This one I also got for free, as far as I remember, maybe together with the Ultra 5. This one comes with a 40 MHz processor and 60 MB of RAM. Both are slightly upgradable. At the time I did not give it too much attention because already 10 years ago when I got it for free, it obviously was super slow, 40 MHz. Probably only took it to save it from the trash bin and thought um, I can eventually test 32-bit booting because otherwise I only had a 64-bit Ultra Spark. So I probably saw it there. I can put it in some corner and maybe test boot it once or twice or something. As far as I remember, I spent some time on this, some weekends and nights or something. But over 10 years ago, I could not really get it to work right at all or fully boot it and such because various things the Spark Linux loader was notorious for being miscompiled by GCC and such. So even on Ultra Spark, I had problems that not each version compiled with uh, any GCC would just boot. So actually, I spent way too much time uh, digging around in machine code surrounding the Spark Linux loader. That was uh, really annoying each time we built a T2 or Rock Linux Spark release. As far as I remember, over a decade ago, I only got a partially booted something. Given 40 MHz, it was not worth spending much more time on this. However, now for the YouTube videos, I took some extra time over Christmas and New Year together with the SGA Octane to finally get it booted in Linux, which was today, a decade later, even a greater challenge because in the meantime, support for this Sun architecture was recently removed in the Linux kernel. So nowadays I had to endure extra pain to get this working at all again with some slightly older versions of the Linux kernel, GCC and such. And also the last Linux kernel versions where the code was still included, 3 point something. Um, they would not even work, probably because of some timer IRQ refactoring that I have not yet still analyzed. The last Linux kernel that I can hopefully show you in a minute is 2.6.30 or 2.6.29 or something. And even that I had to spend extra time getting the SCSI controller to work because of earlier refactoring of this also, where the DMA controller node would not be found and used from the open firmware device tree. So quite some time spent on this and this is also the reasons the SGI Octane and the Spark Station are both of the reasons why I did not upload many videos to YouTube in December because I spent all my extra time mostly working on these two machines. And in retrospect, as I said in other videos already, the next time I will probably make more raw videos showing all the debugging and fiddling back and forth and such because currently I cannot allocate that much of my relatively free time, which is not so much free, but anyway, and not produce anything. So to continue this YouTube video and maybe to have a better learning experience for you, I will film more raw things in the future and also document the process. One thing I modified here at the site was a disk drive and obviously 1.4 megabyte floppies were not much use for me a decade ago. So I cut this plastic and even metal case inside and installed a SCSI CD-ROM, which obviously was more useful for me. However, having read up on the internet about this machine for this video, I read that this was an auto-ejecting drive, so probably without a mechanical button and some automatic eject mechanism. And now that I read this, I wonder where I put this floppy because that would be a little bit of a pity not to have this floppy anymore, but I really wonder if I have it in some box somewhere. So on the other hand, yeah, floppies are not the most useful thing nowadays. And yeah, that's what it is now. I think the CD-ROM, I could have cut it it's slightly better. It's slightly off, but my free time was limited. I was a student back then. And as I said, the machine had not the highest priority. I was happy when I had the CD-ROM in there at all. So I did this rather quickly in half of an hour or so just to get this done. My tip for you would be um, to spend slightly more time to polish this in even better. On the back it does not look that much different than the Ultra 5. Power obviously, mechanical power button. Um, here we got SCSI. Here's a regular workstation 13W3 analog video connector that you've seen in my SG Octane video already that you can with an adapter usually connect to VGA displays. This being the same adapter I used on the SGI Octane. Here is an AUI 
Ethernet connector where you connect the physical transmitter to. I got here some level one physical transmitter together with the machine for regular 10 megabit twisted pair that goes in like this and your ethernet cable going in there. And we also got some serial or CNP as well as a sun specific keyboard connector and an audio in out port here that surprisingly uses the same connector like keyboard and is only used on this early Sun machines, as far as I know. Surprisingly, it has a Linux driver, but unfortunately it's only some 8 kHz mu law or a compressed coded or something. Certainly not the highest audio quality. And uh, it's actually an AMD codec. I did not even know that AMD was making audio codecs. Really funny. I read something about uh, being able to be used as ISDN modem thing or so. So yeah, there it's it. It opens up like this. I need to be a little bit careful here due to my CD-ROM cutout. Hardware-wise, this is supposed to be the Cypress Spark CPU. 32-bit Spark, 40 MHz, maybe some 18T RAM controller. The famous NVRAM ID PROM, where the battery dies. Unfortunately, this one I tried to modify and I accidentally destroyed the original one. I can make a detailed video about this later on. This is a new one that I ordered last month. Unfortunately, the new ones are not 100% compatible, so it doesn't work 100% unfortunately. I also wonder why do the manufacturers need to change the specification and production. If you order this as replacement parts you can't even really use it. A little bit strange. By the way some some AMD chips here. At least one of those is for the audio port. The boot ROM and obviously the memory. It's quite full. However these are only 16 megabytes unfortunately. I think you can get up to 64 megabyte on this board and apparently 128 with some RAM expansion board that I think goes into this SBUS slots here. It has two SCSI ports for hard drives, where the second I use for my CD-ROM modification here. There is also the floppy port that I don't use anymore. The SBUS cards have a nice connector. Maybe this is some industry standard connector. This is a relatively newish frame buffer. This is a Sun CG6, or was it even a CG6 Plus? What is sometimes surprisingly that this one is assembled in Japan. This is, of course, nowadays everything is assembled in China. This is always really interesting to see in the Ultra 5. The CPU was made in the UK. Here this is assembled in Japan. This is really from a time where the manufacturing world was still a little bit more diverse. Below this more AMD chips and AT&T chips. Actually, here are names of engineers on this Sun CG6 frame buffer. I wonder why some are crossed out. Were they not in the team anymore? Did they leave the company? I have to say this looks a little bit rude, um, as if they passed away. I <coughs> hope not. Yeah, so that is the inside look. Here's also some beeper. There are also some Sun frame buffer cards that are bigger, so other maybe earlier frame buffers also cover two slots. And as I said, there's RAM expansion, there's also SCSI expansions and uh, other kinds of... I think I read somewhere over 200 or nearly 300 different SBUS cards were made. The CD-ROM I simply screwed in. The hard disk is theoretically snapped in here with plastic. So you could slide the hard disk out by pressing down some plastic nose in the front and then slide it out into this direction. But it is also a pretty compact cabling here, even with my CD-ROM modification that this fits so tightly there. Okay, so much to the inside look. Pretty nice compact machine. So let's hope it does still work. After all this disassembly, I'm always a little bit nervous that the SBOS cards and such still do work. Blinking some postcode, so in case this is hanging, it should already give some indication which test failed. So as you can see, it says starting real time clock, which I think it should only say once. Then um, replace and VRAM self test failed. However, that is a brand new NVRAM, and I read already the set thing is. There were people soldering batteries on these NVRAMs and people were saying nah, no, I would not bother soldering and wasting time and I would buy a new one. And I brought a new one and it's not compatible. So thank you very much for all those people who say don't bother with this battery soldering. New one doesn't really help much either. So I will probably either someday in the future I will analyze what exactly is wrong with this new NVRAM and if this can potentially be made to work. Anyway, in the short term, I will most likely move this NVRAM from the Sun IPX. That should be the same in this machine and solder a battery to this one. And in the meantime, it is already keeping my 
placeholder ethernet and host id address so this is already progress otherwise i would have like in the sun ultra 5 video enter that each time i turn it on as far as i see the only thing that is not working is the real time clock and maybe this is only not starting time the show anyway so we can uh, new command boot here the open firmware is similar to the one of the ultra 5 this logo apparently is different for all the frame buffers used and so we have a pretty sun color graphic 6 frame buffer here it shows here uh, a whopping 60 megabyte of memory yeah let's boot as i said this is much further than i probably was over a decade ago um, this is zero i had to hack around and uh, get working again and this will fully boot linux the latest kernel i could get working and um, as i said support for this old machines was removed in three point something and even before it was apparently broken yeah some udev warnings as usual with this i finally got it working and just some minor details are not fully working the rest of the system should come up slowly but steadily and this is also what i mentioned in the other video before my optimization, this is already with optimized dot drawing. Without my optimized dot drawing, the for loop that I showed in the last video about the init system and 222 characters, because the for loop that was forking an echo or print process or something, 80 or over 80 vocations of echo or a print or something, you could actually see the dots drawing in half of a second or something that was really um, there you see this modern system you don't even realize how slow um, but here forking program invocations for drawing single character starts really to be visible and there we have it root login that is the lovely 40 megahertz cypress ross spark cpu for me, surprisingly, that this was third-party sourced from Sun as they created the Spark architecture. And here are some Texas Instruments FPU, 16 megs of RAM. Linux kernel leaves this 13 something megabytes as totally usable. 11 are used, but this is also caches and buffers. So we have here 5.8 megabyte in caches and 1.3 megabyte in buffers. And this substructed leaves 4.3 megabyte used right now, apparently 8.8 .8 megabyte free. Actually, I even reinstalled this like three times until it was working best. I also optimized some memory usage and startup performance and, um, and things. And I also rebuilt uh, some details with glibc and such over and over. Initially, my processes were actually segmentation faulting out of memory before a swap could be activated because I made the beginner mistake of using X4 which used way more memory. I probably also should get rid of X2 because the X2 module may even use some 500K here, but maybe Zillow wasn't booting from this or something. But in this kind of systems, you really see even choosing the file system can save you a megabyte of memory and such. On a modern x86 Linux system, you will have here maybe 30 modules loaded or even more. And here we have five modules loaded. Yeah, <clears throat> if you run things like dmessage, you see how um, slow frame buffer scrolling is. On this kind of machines it's probably not accelerated this esp scasi driver that i had to modify to work on this machine so this is 2639.4 which is the currently last kernel i could working and even this i had to modify the esp scasi driver and later kernels i think the first linux kernel 3 includes a refactoring of the irq framework or something for spark which probably broke this machine because nobody tested it and Compiler-wise, so this is currently running a relatively new, I think. So this is uh, glibc. So you see I'm not making this up. I compiled this over Christmas 25th. And even relatively new, already with native POSIX Linux threads, surprisingly. I did not expect this to work and compiled with GCC 4.4. Usually I have to go back also with the GCC compiler versions because the newer compiler usually do not compile the Linux kernel and glibc because of stricter type checking and things like this. Going back with glibc and the Linux kernel. And this is also one thing that really annoys me is that glibc, normally I would not necessarily have to go back with the glibc on the systems, but I only have to because the new glibcs 
require newer kernel features. So to be able to run a glibc on this older kernel, I also have to go back with glibc versions, which I find a little bit annoying. I wish they would keep kernel ABI compatibility a little bit longer. So GCC, you see everything you run takes a little bit to run. I even have here a partial T2 checkout. I think it consumed too much memory somewhere in the middle of the checkout, but just for the fun, let's compile. We have a collection of Hello World programs in some languages that are just one or two liners. And you see the nothing better than the sound of the SCSI hard drive. This time with time. Second slightly off of the cache. But with this 40 megahertz and 60 megabyte of RAM, obviously only with the help of swap, it can actually compile binaries. So this Hello World takes a whopping 11.5 seconds to compile the second time partially out of the cache. And the program indeed runs. But you certainly do not want to run configure, make, make, install on this 40 megahertz machines. Everything on this little machine is fully cross-compiled. Um, with this kind of compile speed you wait weeks for something to compile nowadays with our two chain. Back in the day of course everything was smaller and the compiler was smaller and faster. Back in the day they probably could bootstrap their system on machines like this. But nowadays, 25 years after the peak of the system distribution, everything just became bigger. Compiler programs, um, also support shared libraries that are loaded and so on. Like with Turbo C development on DOS where you could compile things on a 386, you could certainly run things on this. Unfortunately, it's not yet 100% stable, so as soon as I start to run more things, eventually I will probably get segmentation faults. I have not yet figured out why this happens. Maybe this is some kernel bug. Probably. See, even, even just loading the SSH binary takes some five seconds or so. Yeah, as I said, this is not 100% totally stable and it is certainly possible to get newer Linux kernels running where the support was not yet removed after fixing this IRQ refactoring stuff. Maybe I will do this another weekend or snowy winter day. In the future, more documented on YouTube. We also have the X server. Theoretically, it can run an X server and I would be really curious to see how slow that is. However, that currently hard blocks the machine if I try to run it. So right now I have I have currently the latest, I think, is it the latest X server? I lost overview, but maybe it is. And the Sun CG6, it appears to start, but then deadlocks the machine or something. I think even the kernel dies enough not to have SSH running anymore. For the future, there are still some things to investigate if we want to have this vintage machines running 100% fully again on Linux. And let me know in the comments below if you want to see me hacking on this X server and Sun CG6 and get this running and see what the speed is on this classic vintage Unix machines. So I hope you find this interesting. It would be awesome to show you support by giving it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe for plenty of more IT videos to come.